Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Bassiano, curator of the Ottawa Art Gallery, and I'd like to welcome you to our program with artists Leslie Reed and Robert Kautick, whose works are currently on view as part of our exhibition, Dark Ice. This conversation with Leslie and Robert is moderated by Dr. Heather Igleliorte and is presented in partnership with the Inuit Futures Project, an initiative that aims to support Inuit and Inuvialui in Canada in their pursuit of higher education and professional opportunities in all aspects of the arts and humanities. As with all of our programs, virtual or not, I'll begin by acknowledging that the Ottawa Art Gallery, the host institution of this program, is situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin peoples. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I'd now like to hand the screen over to Heather, who will be providing us with an opening introduction. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dr. Heather Gluyukti. I'm an Inuk and Newfoundlander from Nunatsiavut, currently based in Montreal, and I direct the Inuit Futures Project, which you just heard of. And this is a conversation that's in collaboration between the Ottawa Art Gallery and the Inuit Futures Project. And so I'm very, very grateful and happy to be here today with two artists that I deeply admire to talk about their forthcoming exhibition, Dark Ice. Climate change is having a profound impact on global ecosystems and is most dramatically evident in northern landscapes and communities. In the face of these challenges, Inuit knowledge and community building are increasingly at risk, making it essential to adopt a variety of approaches in combination with Inuit and settler collaboration. Dark Ice demonstrates the intersections between the unique artistic studio and land-based practices of Leslie Reed of Ottawa and Robert Kautuk of Kangiktugapik, Nunavut. Alongside critical curatorial work, the exhibition features photographs, paintings, and videos of Arctic land and ice and of communities and their experiences. <laughs> so it's really wonderful to get to talk to two artists who I have uh, so greatly admired for so long and, and about practices which I think are both really relevant and also really compelling aesthetically. And so it's, it's a real thrill for me. As I said, I uh, I've, I've known Leslie for many years now, having lived in Ottawa myself um, a long time ago, worked at the Carleton University Art Gallery. And uh, just before the call, we were chatting, I was saying I, I bought one of Robert's, uh, a print of one of his photographs um, that I bought years ago, I think, before you were, uh, before you started to get kind of famous. And so it's very exciting to get to be on a call with you both. And so I thought I would start by just asking you, um, maybe to do a quick introduction to yourself and how you got into artistic practice in general. I think that the Ottawa Art Gallery and Inuit Futures audiences are going to be really interested to hear about how um, how you even become an artist, I think is a big thing for our audience, certainly, because we have a lot of aspiring artists who work for Inuit Futures and who are around it. And so I would love to start, let's start, maybe Leslie, you could tell us about how you got into artistic practice. Oh, that's, that's the story of a lifetime, I think, Heather, <laughs> especially at my age. Um, but going back, it became a love affair with seeing painting uh, while I was, in fact, a political science student at Queen's, not an art student. Started taking art history classes, was painting on the side, and that was it. I decided I had to go to art school and uh, enjoyed it immensely. It was a great time to be in England but had to come back, had no money uh, for one thing, and was lucky to get some started as part-time teaching when I came to Ottawa where uh, my mother was ill. And that's why I came back here to this city and um, just kept going. I was really fortunate in that there were areas around this, the, the, uh, this in this region, particularly in West Quebec, that that I responded to very physically and emotionally. They were it was the island of Grand Canyon that my grandmother was born on. Mm. And as a child, we camped there with them under canvas every summer, all summer. And to rediscover that place was really what uh, inspired me to look at light and space, but in relation to the people who had inhabited that light and space. And that really began what I've looked at ever since, including going up to the Arctic. Is, is how the land has been affected, how that inflects light and space and our response as we experience it. But it did start going back to the, the island of my grandmother's birth. 
It is, um, it's so fascinating to me to hear that the connection between your grandmother and then also the, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing the story about how you traced your father's footsteps as a, uh, in, <laughs> in that, like throughout the Arctic and during the Cold War. And I think that's even like, you know, it's, it's got some heightened relevance right now, thinking back oh, about it, the Cold War and, and what's happening in the world right now. And so it, it's very, very much so. Yeah, but before we before we get into that, Robert, I you know Leslie, you mentioned that you are um, a art school trained artist, but Robert, am I correct in thinking that you are a self taught artist? I am a self taught artist. So, how did you get started in photography? It, like Leslie, I it's been my lifetime, like it happened over my lifetime like I, I just didn't start recently taking photos it's been ever since I can remember um I've had a camera like years when I started it was just a disposable film where I had to send a roll of film when I finished somewhere I don't even know where but it was through our local store they would send it out and then it would take a month or two to get back. And then digital cameras were like cheaper. Enough. And that's when I started with the digital cameras and then drone technology came around. I was like interested in them because you can see what you can't see on the ground, like bird's eye view. It's, it, it's incredible to think about it just in your lifetimes, how quickly the technology has changed and what kind, what that kind of opens up. And I think that you're right, Robert, like to have been a photographer working in uh, any of our northern communities that are mostly fly in only and to be uh, to be working in that medium back when you had to send out film to be processed and send back like that takes real dedication and commitment to uh to working in that way there's certainly i think that there there you are at the fore of a big movement of inuit photography but a lot of that is because uh the digital photographs have made it so much easier for artists to work what kind of camera are you using uh now robert it's a sony a7r3 and what is the what is the benefit of using a that kind of a camera when you're working with aerial photography or is it one that is specific for the thing I don't know that much about how aerial I mean I know what drones are <laughs> I know how they work but um, I would love to hear a little bit more about what the process is like for aerial photography for aerial photography I mostly use a Mavic 2 zoom okay which has a zoom capability and it's quite small like folded up um, it's probably the size of uh, 13 Pro Max or something, just a bit bigger than that. Okay. Hold it in. Um, the process takes quite a bit because you're trying to envision what you want to shoot beforehand because you're limited to like 20 minutes of flight time. Like, oh, you're okay. very limited to time. So you have to plan it or take it as you go. Like, if I'm hunting and bring the drone, it's at that moment, I want the drone up. I can't even plan it because animals aren't predictable like me, or the land's not predictable, or the weather's not predictable. <laughs> so you kind of need takes... to be ready to go. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about the the photograph of yours, um, the walrus hunt that I have, and what an incredible moment that is. And that's you in the center of the photo. <laughs> like, are, are you using an iPad to control it? Because like, you are, you are, you know, it, for anyone who hasn't seen it, we're going to put it up on the screen. But it is an aerial photograph of you on an iceberg, butchering all, you and uh, is that family members? Who are you with in that image? It's guys from Igluri. It was a trip with the culture school here and the instructors at the college went to Iglutic to train, like to get trained how they hunt wars and how they butcher wars and then how they cache it. So we can 
start using the, the knowledge here. It's such a striking image because of the um, opacity of the ice, I think, as it goes out into the water. It's, it's just a really, and then the sort of the red and green contrast is really striking. It was, uh, we sorry. were just finishing butchering and then I was like, I have a drone, why not put it up and see from a different angle? So I asked the guys to stop moving, like, because we were almost packing the meat away into the boat. I asked them to stop for a few minutes so I can take a photo. It's, uh, it's I think, a, a really a stunning image in a lot of different ways and just kind of a, a moment in the life of, I didn't realize that drones can only be operated for about 20 minutes at a time. Is that like because of the battery life? Because of the battery life and the temperature of the air outside. Right. And is that an issue that you also encountered in your work, Leslie? Because I do know that the cameras can be, it can be a real challenge to be photographing outside in the cold. And also just to like, to have to take your hands out of your <laughs> mitts and, and also operate the camera. Like that's a, that's a real thing. Right? <laughs> like... I, have, I have to admit that I haven't been up in the north when it's been really, really cold. I will soon, but I haven't been yet. And uh, I have worried about that. But where I did encounter it was in both trips I've made. One was with the military and I was trying to um, go, arrange to go over flight lines that had been mapped uh, and flown over by my father in the 40s and early 50s. So it was a bit of a needle in a haystack. However, a lot of the flight lines that I went up with in the Griffin helicopters were the same flight lines that had been flown in the 40s. So I was actually leaning out of the helicopter with my camera around oh my, my neck and, and a belt around my waist. They, they, they opened the door for me. I was astounded. And I had five flights, I think, they organized both in, in Yukon and over the glaciers around uh, north and south of, of Whitehorse and then around Resolute over the entire island. Um, so I was allowed to lean out and get what are almost, you know, I envy Robert and his drone because I was trying to sort of uh, echo that, but I was leaning out of the helicopter to get vertical shots. And all the military flights that my, or camera work that my father was flying were vertical. So I was able to then compare my photograph in, in 2013 with their photographs in 1948. And I, my first, Instinct, uh, the first reason I went was just look for climate change and I found it. I can compare the NAPL, the National Air Photo Library photographs that are still uh, stored in Ottawa uh, with my own photographs. And it was quite, actually quite shocking to see what some of the changes were. Robert, what was that process like going to see your photos printed? Was that the first time that you'd ever got to actually see them, uh, like see that process happening? Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Like, it was, I haven't really printed anything myself because it's too expensive to ship it up. But seeing samples of how big and what texture or they will be at in the finished product, it was awesome. Like, I had fun in the printer. <laughs> Did that happen in Ottawa or was that in Toronto? That was in Gatineau. In Gatineau. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. So how did you, did you decide which works were going to make it in the show together? Or did you do, did the curator select them or what was that process like? I'll ask Robert first. Do you like, what, how did it you was, decide which of your images? It was the curator and ourselves, like what's going to work with, the different work that Leslie and I do, what's gonna complement or whatever, it's gonna work. What about you, Leslie? How did you decide which works would be included? There was a really good um, kind of, the work is very different that I'm showing, but there was a good reciprocal uh, experience that was going on. My, uh, some of it is uh, photographs of an, a glacier front uh, printed on aluminum that's 30 feet long. Uh, 
There are some paintings that of going through Bellet Strait, which is a harrowing experience uh, that are large scale, no small paintings, light boxes yeah. I've done. And the light boxes reflect those early uh, experiences leaning out of the helicopter. Uh, so that, um, yeah, to, to make it all fit together has been quite a challenge. But in fact, I think it, the, the works speak to each other really uh, movingly and meaningfully. Um, part of that is Rebecca, of course, uh, who's uh, really eyeing everything all the time and seeing what works and what doesn't. And the designer that she's working with that has made everything uh, fit and, and, the, and I think the works are very independent, but they speak to each other. Uh, there's there's Bellet Strait. Um, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to talk about these. Are they, is this the series of paintings that is in the exhibition? Is this the only ones, or are there more paintings in this? There are only three. Uh, they total uh, eighteen feet across, uh, and um, Bellet Strait is only two kilometers wide, by the way, and it's a very treacherous bit of sailing which mm. we all felt and what I really felt was in fact that there was this band of ice on the horizon that we hoped we would get through <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Franklin didn't by the way <laughs> but we did uh, so it was quite an experience you know the, basically seeing the top of the world and it's falling off you go over the edge of that ice and, and what's beyond so it spoke both to the experience of the Arctic, but also to what is happening now with climate change, that there is no certainty, there is no passage through that any of us can predict. I think these are really compelling. And like, like you were saying with the uh, hanging out of a helicopter, like with these, you can really get the feeling like this is from the perspective of someone who is uh, in the boat making the passage. Like you, you really do have that, there, there's sort of the presence of the artist is there. And I, I think it's it's really interesting also, Robert, if we look at your pieces like this work, for example, where it's like, you know, you are, <laughs> I don't know, you've gotten off your skidoo because you're clearly not on the trail, but like just <laughs> having that perspective of the of the three snowmobiles, four snowmobiles going off into the distance here with this, um, with the, uh, you know, and you're clearly on the ice in this image. I, I really find it very compelling that there are people or like evidence of that perspective in all of your works. Who are these people, Robert? These are scientists that come up, they used to be seasonally to maintain the weather stations that we have our own flood river. But due to COVID, they haven't been up for a few years. They were planning to come up this year, but I don't think they will be able to, but it's a trip north of Clyde and I'm just off the trail on my skidoo and then just took a photo when they were passing by. I, I think that makes sense because again of course it speaks to both of your really interesting use of perspective in the work. Um, why is it what do you work with them Robert? Is this a part of a climate change initiative that you also work on? Do you work it, with the scientists? I work with them yes they yeah and they run the back end of the weather station, which you can view online. Both of you have been documenting climate change in your work. I wonder if, Leslie, you want to speak a little bit to that photographic series that you said. Are those photos in this exhibition? And are they, and like, because I, I know that you did an exhibition that was the sort of side by side, but maybe I'll ask you, Leslie, first to talk a little bit about how climate change shows up in your photography. And then Robert, maybe you could talk a little bit about your perspective on it. Um, most of it shows up in the light boxes that I've made. These two will be in the show. And on the left is uh, an NAPL image from 1949, I believe. And then my image is from 2013. Wow. And so one is, it's 70 years ago, and it's from 20,000 feet up. Mine in that one is from a, a Hercules, because I, that was a, with the military. All the others are me leaning over the deck of the ship, over the railings of the ships. Again, wow. pretending that I'm 20,000 feet up, but I'm only <laughs> about 40 feet up. But what, what struck me is that you can't actually establish time and space in these works. They start to collapse. Mm. And it's only by reading the label that you realize that there's a, both a time and a distance that varies enormously between them. 
it's really fascinating when you talk about distance uh, time and distance because I think also that that like you don't know if you're 20,000 feet or 40 feet away it's also like you know I think that we think that we're 20,000 feet above climate change and really it's it's a 40 foot drop and so yes yeah that, I think that's very, <laughs> that's poignant, very poignant way to think about it is that it's it's more urgent than we realize and of course the arctic draws attention to that uh, more dramatically than uh, perhaps many other places on earth that we are seeing this uh, happening and changing so rapidly. Robert, what are, what are you seeing you know, on the ground in the north? I'll say global warming is like a cycle that happens every, I'll say 20 years or so. Like it was 20 years ago, it, it's probably, the environment that we have now happened. And then in the change of time, it varies from year to year, but it feels like we went already went through it 20, 25 years ago or 30 years ago. It, it feels like it's just a cycle. So I'm, I'm super interested in what you're saying, Robert, about it seeming to be on a bit of a cycle. Do you find that the the ice is as thick. Was there a period where it seemed to get weaker? I know that's certainly the case in Anastasiabad is it's become unpredictable. When the break, like it, when I was a kid, it was clockwork, you know, like you could kind of, like you could plan your travel around a particular date that things were gonna start uh, freezing and thawing, you know, like to the week or to the couple of week period, you kind of knew when the freeze up and the thaw was coming. Do you find that it is cycling around now? Yes. And the predictability, we have to adapt to it now because it varies year to year now. When I was a kid, it was like what you said, very predictable to the week or something yeah. like that. You both had worked in the aerial perspective in your work, which I think is really fascinating, obviously in, in two very different kinds of contexts. Um, what is it about the bird's eye view that you like so much, Robert? It's a different scene. Because we're so used to, from our eye level, we're looking at a plane. With drone, it's like in between eye level and the plane. You're not that high, but you're high enough to see a different scene of the same scene, but you're so used to with your eye level. Robert, do you do you plan your photos with when you're talking about friends and family and other people who are to show up in your work as well? Do you um, do you like you said that you've only usually got about 20 minutes in which to take the images so how much do you involve other community members in the creation of the work or do you just always have it ready so that you can capture a spontaneous moment with the drone it's limited to 20 minutes because you're trying to save weight on the battery because you're going to be flying anyways but with the mirrorless or DSLR, it's same, pretty much the same thing for me. I don't usually plan anything, but it's right at the moment, like on the moment. <laughs> does anyone ever not want to be in the photo or does everyone like to get involved? A lot don't like getting their photo taken and for sure myself, I hate being in front of the camera that's why i'm behind it <laughs> but that's one of the funnest parts of the of the uh photo that i have is that there's like well there's someone is looking straight up at the at the camera and smiling which is great but then you can see that the artist is actually looking down and looking at the ipad which i think is also it's a fun kind of and then there are other people who are just like i'm busy over here butchering this wall works so like, you know i don't have time i'm just gonna stand very still for a moment so you can get this shot <laughs> Yeah. I think that's the sort of really dynamic, like capture it in the moment kind of thing. And of course you can't plan for what that will look like, like where the blood will flow and like how that's going to look when you're all done on the ice. So it, it, you really do get this sense that you've just captured this, uh, like this one slice of a, of a day, you know? Yeah. 
really amazing. So this has been a, a really fascinating conversation. I'm so grateful to you both for uh, taking the time out to chat with me about the exhibition. I was hoping you could, maybe we could end with you just talking about which of the works in the show, maybe something that we haven't talked about already, like which of the works in the show is your own favorite? You know, I'm sure that as audiences come together, they will all decide what their own favorite works from the show are. But uh, maybe I'll start with you, Leslie. What's, what's your favorite work that you've included in the exhibition? The work that we haven't talked about is one that is not from the Canadian art. It's from a residency I did in Svalbard in the glacier fields there from a tall ship. And that was all artists and writers on board. So it was very different atmosphere and a very creative atmosphere. And I did a stitched photograph of a glacier front and it was quite a gray day and the photographs are quite gray and they've been printed on aluminum over 30 feet. And it's quite eerie to be looking, you know what it is, but it actually looks like graffiti. Right. So you're, you're in this strange uh, Arctic space. And of course there has never been in an indig indigenous population in Svalbard. They had coal miners and whalers, but trappers, but no, no indigeneity. Uh, it's warming at twice the rate of anywhere else in the world. And here was this massive, massive calving glacier front. And what do you do with it? Well, I turned it into aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering why, but it seemed that it needed to be somehow uh, frozen in time. So that's what I did with it. Yeah. Frozen in time, an alternative title for the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, perhaps. perhaps. I love it. I love a good pun. <laughs> and, and what I didn't about plan you? it. It came out. <laughs> And, and what about you, Robert? Uh, what's, what's one of your favorite works in the show that we haven't already talked about? It's a photo of different ice layers in the photo. And then you can see myself and my wife in the pic picture, mm. right in the bottom left corner. It's, we look very tiny in the photo. And you see different layers of ice that's forming, like dark, dark area, fresh ice, and then gets darker by if you when you go down. It's different layer, different layers of forming ice. Like mm. Frozen in time, like Leslie said. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I think that it, this has been just a, a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you both again, uh, Nakumi, for joining us today.